small old lifters. Today I'm back with Louis Simmons of Westside Barbell and we're going to do a little interview. So Louis, could you tell us about your most fond Dave Tate stories? I found just fun Dave Tate stories just training with his great training partner. Mm -hmm. He was one of many, Chuck Bogopol, Kenny Patterson. Uh, but I have many, many training partners. That's that's the whole key to training is having training partners. A power rack and a training partner. Mm-hmm. Because didn't he used to um, get under your skin a bit? Not a, no, for a get a good way. Yeah, always under my skin. I hated the fucker. And he hated me, and that's the way it should be. Um, could you talk to us about Conjugate Club? Conjugate Club, as uh, is, uh, we're presenting this, is we're going to have a vast amount of information about training. It's going to go from uh, powerlifting to weightlifting, track and field, to actually police tactics, um, rehabilitation, and prehab where people don't get hurt and how to train correctly. Periodization is going to cover mm -hmm. it all. Spatial exercises, spatial strength training, all the velocities, and, and how to jump, and it's going to cover about everything you can think of in sports, including the PNF. A lot of people don't realize PNF is also a method of becoming stronger. Mm -hmm. Um, how are people to access it? Is it through an app or online? Website. Website. <laughs> um, of interest to the UK lifters, how is Dave Jenkinson getting along at Westside Barber? Very good, making tremendous progress. Look for Dave Jenkins to break a world record very soon. All time total record. Mm -hmm. um, where is he going to do that, WPO? We're making a meet first of that September 21st in Ohio as a tester and then we're going to the WPO. We're not too sure about the WPO, how well it's going to be run or anything mm -hmm. else. Yeah, because it's just re-emerging after a right. long a long time. Um, are there any plans to make an updated edition of the Book of Methods? Is there anything in there that is now outdated to your current methods? Nothing's outdated. We just tried to push up more volume. We've got new exercises. Everyone knows about our new machinery. Like my static dynamic development developer is out now and it's going to revolutionize the world. Mm -hmm. and, and how is the static dynamic developer um, to be used in sports training to revolutionize it? Well, if you want to be explosive, you're going to pull on a bar that doesn't move or pull on a rope um, basically for one or two seconds in most cases and release. And for explosive strength, you'll use a, a resistance of 30 to 40 percent. If you want to build your strength speed like we do, um, you'll mm -hmm. use weights. You pull on a bar, you load up a bar, 80, you'll say 80 percent of your best um, deadlift. If you're an 800 pound dead, over, you load up 640, pull on the bar for a couple seconds, release and smoke up 640. And then also maximal strength. Mm -hmm. If you're an 800 pound dead, if you load up maybe 750, pull on the bar for two seconds at your sticky point, then release and up it comes. So people talk about with speed that the speed of the bar is important. So how you is... You have to know what you're training. So, so could you explain how a static bar um, transfers differently? Because by pulling on an isometric bar, you could produce 15% more strength than lifting weights. Mm -hmm. So then you release, you build up the other. If you lift a weight, you got 500 pounds on the bar on a deadlift. You have to generate up to at least 500 pounds to get it off the floor, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so it's going to take time to do that. It's um, but if you could generate 500 plus pounds and then release the button, you'll blow it off the floor. But will it affect the, uh, the central nervous system in the same way as failing a weight? No, it affects it in a positive way. I did surveys on it, and I had a gentleman here from India uh, with a, you know, tons of degrees. We came to the same conclusion. Change your central nervous system in 10 minutes. I had one female track athlete that went pro. She could jump on a 49-inch box, and a high school football player that went to Indiana, he could jump on a 49-inch, you know, coincidentally. Um, and that was it. They couldn't break that record. I had to go down and do 10 static holes and then jump on one of our developers come back and ship both jumping on a 53. How long did it take? Was that immediate? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 jumps, come back, jump on 53. Four inch jump is, uh, on your record is amazing. So sports facilities need this machine? Everybody needs this machine. Um, it also can be even used for rehabilitation because isometrically, that's, how, that's what PNF is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it can also be built or used for rehabilitation. With isometric movements, how would you structure these into your training? Max effort, dynamic, or small workouts? And what percent of rep ranges have proved effective? You could do, uh, if, if you want to do a max effort, that's what, if you want to pull on bars, and, you know, heavy weights or bars that's unmovable, builds maximal strength. All right. If you want to build it as explosive strength, 
you actually take a bar, like I said, if you could bench 200, you'd only use, uh, we'll say 80 pounds, and you'd drive off to the second pin at your uh, worst, your mini-max or your sticking point. Just like, bam, off that pin. And then hold it there for a second or two, and then you repeat, and do, you, know, you can do between, um, well, with weights of 30 to 40%, uh, myself and NFL uh, lineman, we found out we could do eight reps and not slow down any. So, and actually, so you could do 48 lifts in that type of weights. And then, of course, the speed strength, it's just like Perlkin says, we get about 24, 25. So could you do that as your secondary movement after bench, Prime, for example? Primary. Primary? Yeah. So you could do it instead of the, the max effort movement, for example? No. Or it if be in the max effort? If you pull on a bar that doesn't move, it is max effort. Mm -hmm. If you pull, if you push, hold on, push on a bar and, and drive it to a second pin at 30 to 40 percent, it's explosive strength. Mm -hmm. It'll build explosive strength. 75 to 85, speed strength. Um, you speak about the sumo deadlift helping making athletes more flexible. Um, how exactly does this work? Also, wide stand squatting. You know, I, I, here in America, everybody says football's played in here. No, it's not. They're always getting out wide. They've got numerous hamstring injuries and groin injuries. And the reason is they don't train white. It makes no sense. Uh, they don't know anything about weight training. They never had classes on it. They, you know, they just, mm -hmm. they're ex-football players in the most part. And they never really had a, an expert teach them how to lift weights. Uh, and when you squat wider, the reason to squat wider is because the squatting is not in games of any kind, but you use more muscle mass. Are your greatest squatters in the world squat wide? I've got the greatest squatters in the world. I have them, male and female. They all both squat wide, and so does everybody else. I've had 26 people over 1,000. Um, th uh, see, three over 1,200. They're all wide squatters. And a female, once, one, one, you trained with one, 132, 600 squat. Heidi. Yes, 148, 674, 165, 770. So, it's an amazing list for a female and a man. Yeah, it's no coincidence. No. Talking about using foam on box squats, um, do you still do this, and what is the purpose of doing it? We use foam a lot of times, and we use a soft box because in the muscles, because um, the reversal strength is slower, so it basically builds muscular strength. If you sit on a hard box, it basically, uh, in the ligaments and tendons, and build explosive strength through the elasticity of the ligaments and tendons. Um, and does wearing knee wraps or knee sleeves while doing box squats um, defeat the purpose? We never do that. Yeah, but do you see any argument in doing it? There'd be no reason to ever do it. Yeah, because no. it would uh, it would break the inertia, right? Uh, it's just hard to do. Uh, it, well, we've never done it. I mean, we've had our heaviest weights with no knee wraps. Mm-hmm. So did I on Monday. Mm, so, there you go. Um, injury prevention. Uh, so, for example, I have issues with my hip flexors. So when I do extended periods of sumo along with West Side style box squats, um, my hip flexors tend to be prone to injury from overuse. So what's the best way to prevent any potential injury from okay. that? Well, I don't know. Monday, was you here and you watched me with the long track girl? The Kylie. The Ukrainian deadlifts and the long track piece, the silver medalist in the Olympics. Uh, where I pushed him down in between two boxes mm -hmm. with a kettlebell. That's how you fix that. That's one way. Okay. Another way is called a hammock lift. You put your head on one box and your feet on one box facing up, and then you raise your pelvic as high as you can, have another person assist you and raise it up as high as you possibly can. That's also, and a third is chair deadlifts. Deadlifting yep. off the chair will absolutely build that up. The bar will flare your knees. You have someone pull back on your sternum and, and push in on your sacrum. So you get perfect alignment, and that's how you um, get tremendous flexibility in the deadlift. But just flexibility is flexibility. And also, see, sumo is best for sports because you push out and you develop more force pushing out than you do pushing down. And it's safer for athletes. All my athletes, I, I have them sumo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's very seldom I have them do conventional. It's just, I've got a million machines built in lower back. Yeah. Um Joint integrity work, is there anything you do to protect the shoulders? Ultra high reps, they'll do like uh, ultra, you know, the, band, the band bar we have, they'll do 150 reps and a lot of workouts just for um, soft tissue, maximum contractions of soft tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, all my machines you see down there, like the inverse curl, it tells me how strong your hamstrings are. Mm -hmm. you know, if you, more weight you take off, the stronger you are. So you're doing on yourself, which would be a Russian knee curl, and you can hold weights. So I can evaluate your hamstring strength by that. 
the lower back, especially the, the bed pins in the lower back, I know how strong your lower back is. And you stand in the bell squat for a long period of time, I know how strong your glutes and hips are. Uh, and uh, so that way I can balance. I find out where you're weak, I work on your weaknesses, and everything is, it just goes up. You watch Heidi pull with you the other day. Her regular net pin was 385, and she smoked 440. Mm -hmm. right, she's only been here four weeks. Um, uh, James today, pulled, yesterday pulled 875 deadlift, 25 pound per hour, already. Just yeah. by, by finding their weaknesses, and these are the two tremendously strong people. Find their weaknesses, fortify the weaknesses, that way you can um, you know, use your, your strengths as, uh, uh, to the utmost. As the upper back muscles are smaller and move less weight when isolated, how do you stop them lagging and preventing over internal rotation? We do a lot of shrugs, internal rotation. We do a lot of shrugs, we do a lot of pull bands apart, we pull face poles, uh, we get in the power pressure we have and do it backwards. Um, you know, power clean, dumbbell power cleans and, and so forth. Uh, snatch grip, deadlifts, many, many things. Um, I've seen Laura Phelps do 150 rep band pull aparts. Would you do that like every day or that, every? As often as you can, at least four times a week, and that's the last thing you do. Start with the biggest exercise, mm -hmm. end with the very smallest, so like bands or cables. What about H rolls? Um, named after Halbert, I think. They're like dumbbell ones. Oh, where he lays on a bench. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure, a lot of that stuff. Anything you can think of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, can you do quad extensions with a band for knees? So, you know, with the joint integrity workouts, you do the hamstring curls. Can you do it with quad extensions? You can, uh, but you know, when you do a, a quad extension, you're actually sharing the knee. And what stabilizes the knee is your hamstrings and calves. Uh -huh. the, hamstring, the calf on the bottom, hamstrings on both sides, above it. So we do an enormous amount of hamstring work. Yeah. And calf work. Um, if a lifter has shoulder issues, could he do speed work all close grip while rehabbing? Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Or use the band bar. Do you think... Or do reverse grip. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Reverse, reverse grip. No, no rotation at all. Just external rotation. For speed, yeah? Yes. Um, as someone just coming out of knee surgery, I know a lifter who has knee reconstruction and cartilage surgery. How would you recommend that he just start training again with um, a patella problem? All right, I had a ruptured patella tendon. All right, I got back to squat 100 more pounds. I ruptured when I was 43 at weight 21, and at 50 I squatted 920. Um, but some of my greatest achievements is uh, Jim Hoskinson had a 744 squat ruptured both patellas, both quad tendons. I brought him back to 11 or 7 squat in the contest. Um, you start out by pulling sleds, all right? Pull slight sleds forward and backwards every day. And then um, you work on your calves a lot. Of, a lot of mostly seated because everybody's standing. A lot of seated calf, a lot of hamstring curls, um, and um, that's pretty much you know, what's going to do it. How a lot to, of sled work. How to pull the sleds in particular, around the waist or? Yes, hook it belt to your waist. Around, hook the strap of your belt around your waist. Could walking help for the calves? It does. Yeah. Walking with sleds. I used to have huge calves, but mm -hmm. not. so Chuck Vogelbull, we did tons of sled walking. The calves are so important in squatting and deadlifting as well. So since we've started talking about sleds, could you talk about how sled work aids recovery? Uh, it's just active rest. You know, there's no pressure on your body. There's not much eccentric loading, so you pull sleds. Um, for, for strength trainers, Anybody that's a sprinter or a powerlifter, don't go more than 60 yards. Just do tricks. You know, if you're an endurance athlete, you know, like a four, you know, 400 meter walks, and actually sometimes 800 meter, a half hour, half a mile, is fine for endurance. But if you want to build a explosive strength or you know, pertaining to your sport, if it's a powerlifter, a weightlifter, a short distance sprinter, then you do short bursts. You know, with that power walking. How long we have rest? Recover, uh, uh, you, the rest is up to you at your level of physical preparedness. Okay. Whatever your heart rate's back to where you want it, you go. I know most track people will pull, will do with, spread, with the sprinting and sleds every 90 seconds. And that's going to build their, their, uh -huh. um, you know, their strength and speed, strength and endurance. Do you do sled work on the deload week before a competition? Yes. I would pull a sled actually up to Wednesday when I leave town on Thursday. With the competition being Sunday or Saturday? S Saturday or Sunday. I always, because I, uh, at the end I lifted. Uh, a lot of our meets were Saturday and Sunday. It doesn't matter. Day doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, sled work on different terrain is much harder on grass than asphalt. So how ex how experimental do you get with this? Yes. 
just where have you got? I did it on a concrete and blacktop. You know, they do most sprinting, and the Jamaicans do a lot of sprinting on grass, uh, but if you pull on grass, it's a lot easier on the shins. Mm-hmm. But I, I never had shin problems. Only sprinters don't have shin problems. When they run on the balls of their feet. Yeah. We don't have deformation. Of, you know, when we run, it's all, all on the balls of their feet. Could we talk about the hip quad and the inverse curl machines? These machines don't get spoken about as much as the bell squat and the reverse hyper. So why are they essential? Well, I just told you, um, because they are evaluators. You know, when you squat, what, what is your hands, what's the, how much is your hamstring doing? Lower back, hips, glutes, back. You, no one can really tell you. Just as you, you hook up an EMG machine. I could put you on the inverse curl and find out real quick how weak you are and how strong you are. And then um, the hip quad is for basically keeping you from having pelvic tilt. A lot of athletes are always leaning over or backwards, and that will correct all that. Um, so chains and bands. Doing chains and bands together, um, what is the effect of this, and should this be restricted to a few sessions a year? We, if you're doing speed work, you have to use bands or chains. <coughs> together. <coughs> no, so you can use them together or use them separately. Mm-hmm. I prefer... You know, um, I did experiments years ago. I was the first one to use chains, you know, exclusively. We all got a lot stronger. Had a very, very strong gym. Six world record holders in Three in the bench, three in the squat, some in the toe. All right. Then when bands came along, bands took us to another dimension. I prefer to use bands all the time because I, you're short and I'm short, but we trained with somebody six foot five. We saw in the box, there's no chain at all in the damn, mm-hmm. all the chains on the ground. So, you know, but bands will adjust in no matter what height you are. And my shortest lifter, Wesley, a 900-pound squatter, he does it. Uh, he actually does better than normally. It takes six plates of the blue to green to squat nine. He's done that with less than that. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, the theory of being shorter, you don't get the same work. It's not true. And years ago, Phil Harrington broke the world record. Uh, he did nine and nine oh four, and he made 600 blue to green band. Uh, you know, right? And then so and uh, a guy um, as another name. His nickname is Dollar Bill. He's a 308 pounder, weighed 300 pounds, six foot one. He did the very same uh, box squat in the gym, went to the senior nationals and squatted 904. So it doesn't really matter. Because yeah. larger men have more mass. Everybody forgets large men have more mass. Yeah. Smaller men. Little men, light, lightweight men and women have to be stronger pound for pound to make up for errors in technique. You cannot get the bar out of the groove or you're dead because of multiple body weights. Chains and bands on accessories. I know a few of your lifters do this. Does it make training too complicated for his own good, or do you uh, endorse it? I really don't care for it. I like real weights in the bottom, tricep extension, all this. Uh, you know, my guys, uh, they're going to learn someday. They're going to have to start training a lot harder. Mm-hmm. This group I got right now has to become a lot stronger. Dave Tate doesn't necessarily believe Circamax is necessary for some lifters, perhaps not appropriate for novice lifters. Do you think novice lifters should follow a different protocol? Uh, uh, novice lifters that don't handle any weight don't have to recover. He's right about that, but everybody needs to taper. You, you have to be strong. How many people you know take their openers uh, the week before the meet, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, if I was worried about my opener, we wouldn't be going to a meet. Yep. If you read, if you ever read uh, Science of Practice of Strength Training and mm-hmm. Late Transformation, read your late transformation and it explains it all to you. It's the same thing that all track people do, Charlie Francis, for instance, and Ben mm-hmm. Johnson, swim coaches, everybody uses the same. Athletes are athletes, doesn't matter what the sport. Recovery is recovery. I say similar about openers. I say if, I, if I'm too worried about opening 2.5 kilos after my last opener, why am I even bothering going to the competition? Um, it's not what you're with, it's what you finish with. Yeah. What advice do you have for an older lifter, a master's lifter? Well, I don't even like the word master's. I don't think there should be such a thing. But if you're older and you're going to lift, you have to train more often. You know, if you look at uh, buffaloes in the jungle, the old buffaloes get cut out of the herd and they get behind, that's when they get caught by lions and die. Mm-hmm. You can't. You have to do more, not less, because you need better recovery. I always train more. I normally train about 10 times a week. So that means more sled work as well, right? More sled work, more, more upper back, more triceps, more reverse hydras. Do, do they need to go to more physiotherapy or more ice baths or something, for example? I don't believe that in that, not necessarily. It's good if you can do it. Mm-hmm. Like the cryo tanks and the flotation tanks they have today. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I'm too, my, the way my mind works, I couldn't do those. Um, shoulder stability is important. 
um, in the bench as well. Um, could isometric holds that lockout of an overhead press support your bench? Just remember, wherever you hold the bar is where you're going to build strength. Mm -hmm. Then it diminishes 15 degrees down to zero. Um, I think if you want to talk about stability, then you need your lot dumbbells at all angles. Incline, decline, flat, and seated. And kettlebell overhead presses maybe? Eh, not so much for kettlebells. I think they're just for jugglers. <laughs> and helping Kylie out with the... For there's some purposes, but for you want to be a strength athlete, you're going to have to have weight. <laughs> I watched Alexis do a, a snatch of 176 pound kettlebell. But kettlebells are made to be done like that mm -hmm. because they rotate around. So, don't, you know what, everybody, you see guys press up, um, you know, clean 100 pound kettlebells or whatever, do the same with a dumbbell. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a lot different. Oh, yeah, speaking of that as well, with the like strongman do those circus dumbbells. Do you recommend these for a power lifter? Not necessarily. You need no. to practice exercise specificity. Mm -hmm. Practice what you preach. Practice your sport. You know, everything we do, all of our special exercises are close to the lateral lifts. So we blend SPP real very close to our sport, SPP. Mm -hmm. Special preparedness. Yeah. Special physical preparedness. Mm -hmm. um, as you train uh, um, upper back, triceps, and side delts after max effort, as this is so many body parts, how do you time manage for this? I train very fast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you need to do like Jinx is already killing his bench press and he's doing a, a, eight sets of eight and heavy dumbbells and then another a hundred light stuff with your bands or light dumbbells or, or um, Jim Williams presses elbows out. Um, is that second workout in the day, the assistance one, is that absolutely essential, especially with uh, bench press training with all the muscle groups? If, if you want to reach the top, you're going to have to train eight times a week. You cannot train just four times a week. You have to go back and train the small muscles. Always use a different, slightly different exercise so you won't have accommodation. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use slingshot to train for your shirted bench? No. No? No. Reverse bands is a waste of time too for strength. Mm -hmm. It's a test, but it will not make you strong. You gotta realize if, the, if you hook up the strong bands that takes 155 pounds at the, off your chest, it's picking up 155 pounds. That's, <laughs> any engineer will tell you that. Yeah. Um, can we talk about the Dave Hoff push? Dave Hoff what? Uh, when Dave Hoff pushed you. Could we talk about that at all? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what exactly happened there? Like, how did you feel after it? Were you hurt? Uh, well, you know, I went up to congratulate him. I thought he was going to headbutt me because he headbutts me a lot. But he didn't. He pushed me. And I banged my head real hard on the ground. And I, when he picked me up, I, I thought my hip was broke. My hip was fine. And I thought my hip was broke. And, uh, he actually, I have I had a bone chip in my right hip for at least eight years that I know of when I got an MRI. He wanted to take it out. And it broke, uh, I had a hard time coming back to Columbus seven and a half hours in Chicago. And I had a, one of our big lifters, uh, John, he's 310 pound kid, 6'5", got me out of my car, thank God, got me in the house. Uh, but when I was able to walk a week later, it, it broke loose and I could actually do opposite toe touches. I could not touch my right hand and my left foot it's since 1973, and I could do it. So, you know, there's always something good come out of something like that. How, uh, how expensive was the steak Dave Hoff bought you after doing that? The steak, he didn't buy me a fucking steak. <laughs> Did he apologize? He bought a steak, he ate it. There wasn't nothing to apologize about. That's what West Side's about. We ain't about your faggots. Hardcore, man. Hardcore. Hardcore, baby. Louis Simmons. You know, you got to pay the price sometimes for success. Uh, he, could, he could do it again if he broke the world record again. Louis Simmons, Dave Hoff, Hardcore, Westside Barbell. We out.